Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Driving down Wesley Drive, Mike Morrison looked at each house. Of the eleven houses from the corner to his house, Mike had framed eight of the homes. The remaining three had been built by John Piercy, a local contractor. There was a rivalry, but not an aggressive, unfriendly rivalry between Piercy Construction and Curtis Construction Incorporated, the company Mike worked for. On one occasion, John had run out of concrete three quarters of the way through a pour and Curtis sent his own crew over to help John finish the pour. Of course, we know that Southeast Corner is the only corner that'll still be standing after first good snowstorm, Lyle Curtis had joked as they were pulling out of the lot. Ah, screw you, Curtis, John had laughed. The two companies also met for the 4th of July picnic in Jordan Air Park, competed in barbecues, softball, and horseshoes. Then, all sat together to eat, sat together to watch the evening's fireworks. Mike was puzzled, but unconcerned when he saw John Piercy's Mercedes-Benz SUV in front of his house. He recognized the SUV because of the plate reading Piercy won. Mike steered into the garage, looked again at the SUV, and then lowered the door of the garage. Hey Rhonda, what's John Piercy doing here? Mike called out as he entered the house. Living room, Rhonda replied loudly. Mike entered the living room, preparing to shake their visitor's hand. But the scene he saw made him withdraw his hand. Rhonda and John were seated on the small couch together. Rhonda looked uncomfortable as Mike entered. John had a smug expression on his face. Michelle and Mickey were sitting on the long couch, and both children had excited looks on their faces. I, uh, so what's going on here? Mike asked Rhonda. I, uh, uh, Mike, I, there's no easy way to say this, Rhonda mumbled. Looking at the floor, their two children, the coffee table, anywhere but at Mike. Then just spit it out, Mike ordered voice growing hard. He's got a swimming pool, 12-year-old Michelle interrupted. And a boat, Mickey added. Said he'll take me out on Merrily Lake and everything. And me too. Michelle shrilled at her 10-year-old brother. See ya, uh, Mike? John started. You. Don't say another word, Mike interrupted the man, voice hard. Mike, don't make this harder than it has to be, Rhonda snapped. Oh, I'm sorry, didn't realize I was the problem here, Mike said sarcastically. Now, there's no need for. John said harshly. Said not another word out of you, snake, Mike growled. John moved to stand up. Mike shoved him back, hard. Mike, don't you dare. Rhonda screamed. I'd thought you'd be a man about this, but I can see, John snarled. What is it about, not another word, is so hard for you understand? Mike asked, backhanding the man across his sneering face. Mike almost smiled at the stunned expression on John Piercy's face. Almost, but his family was falling apart, right in front of his eyes. His daughter, his sweet angel was tossing him aside for a swimming pool. His boy, his son, his tiger was willing to throw him onto the compost heap for a few fishing trips on a boat. Last time Mike had taken Michelle down to the Y, his daughter spent all of her time ogling the cute boys and posing and preening. She had not even dipped a toe into the pool. And Mike had taken Mickey to Merrily Lake several times. They'd gone fishing, father and son. Each time, he had to drag the boy with him. True, it wasn't on a boat, but they'd stood on the banks and cast their lines. The few times Mickey had managed to catch a fish, it had been Mike that removed the fish from the hook. And when they had arrived home, it had been Mike to fillet the fish. After Rhonda and Michelle and Mickey and a glowering John had left the house, Mike sat at the kitchen table with an ice-cold cores and read the petition of divorce. Rhonda was asking for primary physical custody of the children, granting Michael Arthur Morrison, senior ample visitation with the two minor children. She was also requesting 400 a month per child, plus half medical, half education, other incidentals to be discussed as needed. The microwave meal was flavorless and turned a lead in his stomach, but Mike knew he needed to eat. He had been ravenous when he'd walked into his home and also knew he'd need something to absorb the three or four or five beers he'd be having that night. He had two and a half beers. Mike decided there was no use getting drunk. He had an early morning tomorrow. Wife or no wife? Kids or no kids, he had a job that needed to be done. And Rhonda Gladys Livingston Morrison wasn't worth the hangover. Rhonda had been a somewhat buck-toothed, flat-chested 18-year-old when Mike first met her at an auto parts store. The girl was muttering angrily to herself as she tried to figure out which battery to get for her Nissan. Charts right here, Mike quietly said. A hub, but my car's not on there, Rhonda had snapped. And Tweedledum over there is too busy get off his fat bum and come over here. So what kind of car you got? Mike asked. He located the battery she needed and even offered to put it in for her. Tweedledum did glare at her as he rang up the purchase. So, 
where's the car? Mike asked as he lugged the heavy battery out of the store. 17th and Jackson, Rhonda said bitterly. Had to walk here. Mike drove his Ford F-250 to the apartment complex and installed the new battery. Charles Bud Livingston, Rhonda's father came out and talked with Mike. Bud found out that the 24-year-old man was gainfully employed with Curtis Construction, was a bit of a shade tree mechanic and liked ice-cold Coors beer. Well, son, going date my daughter. Need to save up every penny you can, Bud had chuckled. Girl never saw a shiny thing she didn't just have to have. Dad, Rhonda huffed, glancing at the handsome young man. Mike Morrison had sandy blonde hair, a strong, square face and light blue eyes. His brawny build and his tan skin told Rhonda he spent a lot of time doing hard, physical labor, spent a lot of time in the sun. If she had not been so angry when they had first met, she would have flirted with him. Just when she was working up the courage to start flirting, start thrusting her compact backside toward him, her father came out of the apartment. Just when she had planned to start accidentally brushing against the substantial lump she could see in the young man's tight jeans, her father had started talking. Rhonda fought down the wince when Mike glanced over at her. His face bore no emotions, just a cool little smile. Good to know. Mike nodded to Bud as he closed the hood on Rhonda's car. Frank Myers, Tweedledum, called Mike a few days later. Hey Mike, know that snotty little bitch helped with the battery other day? Frank laughed. Came in here looking for your phone number. Give it to her? Uh, yeah, yeah, guess so, sure. Go ahead, Mike agreed. Mike found out that Bud Livingston was right. Rhonda suffered from the disease of more. She saw something, saw that it was good, and had to have more of it. When Mike picked the girl up for their second date, Bud showed Mike Rhonda's bulging closet. Showed Mike the collection of shoes and boots and sandals and six pairs of flip-flops. Six pairs. Six pairs of flip-flops. Hey, Rhonda, that's one for each toe. Huh, Bud teased. On their second date, Mike also found out that Rhonda loved sex. Pregnancy agreed with Rhonda. Mildly attractive when they'd first started dating, Rhonda blossomed as her pregnancy progressed. By the time she gave birth to Michelle Christina Morrison, Rhonda's 31A breasts had filled out to 34C and her flat backside had become a nice bubble butt. Spin class and pilot and yoga trimmed the baby bulge of her belly and Rhonda started turning heads when she walked into shops in the Raquel Falls Mall or the slightly trendier shops in the Binhost Mall. At first, Rhonda did resent her daughter. The infant was getting all the attention, all the gifts from Mike, from Bud and Gladys Livingston, from Mike's co-workers. She convinced Mike that she needed to get braces, convinced that if she was prettier, she'd get more attention, more gifts, more compliments. Rhonda had just had the bulky orthodontic braces removed, revealing a beautiful smile when they discovered that she was pregnant again. Really? Really? Just got my butt into a four and I'm pregnant again? Rhonda shrilled. Mike. Michael Arthur Morrison. You're getting a vasectomy, you hear? Huh. No. No one's cutting on Big Mike's Big Mike. Mike calmly said, gently rocking his sleepy little girl. Being a mother did curb some of Rhonda's demands, did whittle away some of her wish list items. She seemed to grow into the realization that some of her wants and desires did have to take second place to the needs and wants of her children. Now, sitting at his kitchen table, Mike poured the remainder of his third beer down the sink, rinsed the can out and threw it into the recycling bin. In the morning, he'd ask Lyle to recommend a good attorney. Overall, he did agree with the demands in Rhonda's petition. She didn't work, so she should have primary custody of their children. He was fine with paying her child support, was fine with paying half the medical and educational expenses. He did wonder how Rhonda planned to pay for the other half. Probably had manipulated John Piercy into agreeing to pay the other half. But Rhonda was also demanding half his retirement accounts, demanding half his home's value, even though Mike had owned the home outright before they'd even met. And Rhonda had not contributed a single cent to the retirement account. Lyle Curtis stared at Mike when the man approached him about a good lawyer. He listened, face growing redder and redder as Mike talked. That no good, that snake. That snake. Lyle thundered. Exactly what I called him, Mike smiled tightly. I thought, dang it, now wish I'd said something, god dog it. Lyle snapped as he dug through his wallet. Said something about. Mike prompted as Lyle read one of the business cards from his wallet. Picnic, seen John hanging around Rhonda. Looked kind of too friendly. Lyle admitted, handing Mike a business card. Here, that's Trenton's daughter. One kept Mary Lynn from getting half the company when she up and left me last, good God. It already been three, heck, it has been three years. Huh. Anyway, thought John was hanging around Rhonda a little too much. But then Rhonda did have on that outfit, you know? Mike did remember the outfit. 
Rhonda had taken a man's button-up shirt and knotted it underneath her 34C breasts, leaving her flat belly bare, showing off her new gold heart navel ring. The cut-off shorts also showed off her sleek tan legs. Barbara Trenton was a harsh-faced woman with a lean, muscular body. She listened to Mike's story, read over the receipts and bank statements, noting all of Rhonda's expenditures as well as her lack of contributions to the household account. She then read over the petition for divorce, made some changes, and faxed the revised documents to Brian White, Rhonda's attorney. We'll probably have to go into mediation, but I've got to tell you, Mr. Morrison, looking over the amount of money your wife likes to spend, I'm amazed you managed any kind of savings at all, Barbara confided to Mike. And the fact that she contributed not penny one? Yeah, well, Law's a good man work for, Mike said. Uh-huh, Barbara smiled lightly. Barbara's intuition was correct. They did have to go into mediation. Rhonda bitterly contested the revised changes to the petition. She saw the money as hers, saw the house as hers. During the period of time from leaving, until the meeting with the mediator, Rhonda also made it difficult for Mike to have any time with his children. Anytime Mike complained, Rhonda would smugly tell him he should have just signed the original petition. Lyle Curtis also did his part during this period. He spoke to anyone that would listen, told them about John Piercy's stealing another man's wife, stealing another man's children. Building supply retailers suddenly refused to extend credit to Piercy Construction, having to pay cash for bags of concrete, pallets of bricks, rebars, 2x4s, 2x6s. CDX boards put a definite dent in John's available funds. But when his bank dragged their feet on fronting some speculation houses in a new subdivision, John was livid. The weekends Mike did have his children, they were moody, sullen, uncommunicative. Michelle and Mickey did tell Mike of the fun toys John and Mom bought for them, the fun places they'd gone to, the fun things they did. We could be water skiing if we were with Mom and Mr. John, Michelle sneered when Mike suggested going to the Y. Yeah, Dad, Mickey said. I even got a boogie board. When John Piercy put in a bid for a new office building in Raquel Falls, the board looked at the proposal, then at the smiling John Piercy. The CEO of the company did not smile. You? You're living with a woman that you're not married to? Harley Rittmuller asked. Uh, what? What's that got to do with? John sputtered, the question catching him off guard. One that's already married? Leon Weishman asked. Piercy Construction has been doing quality work for over 20 years, John yelled. This is a $4 million job, Mr. Piercy, Harley said flatly. $4 million of our dollars, George Schmidt said. And we're just not comfortable giving $4 million of our dollars to a man has proven to be untrustworthy. So, thank you, but we've decided to go with someone else, Mr. Piercy, Harley concluded. John Piercy was livid when he saw Lyle Curtis and Harley Rittmuller, Leon Weishman and Mike Morrison smiling faces on the evening news. The newscaster spoke of the groundbreaking ceremony that had been held earlier that day. Four million. Four million dollars, John muttered bitterly as the four men laughed as all four attempted, poorly, to all use the symbolic shovel together to dig the first shovel of earth. John's mood went from bad to worse when Ray Mangetti, one of his painters, let him know his paycheck had been returned, NSF. Ray had been with John since his first day in business and now stood, smiling nervously in John's office. I mean, hey, you know, I mean, shit happens, you know? Ray said, Frida, you know, my wife, swears up and down she sent in the payment, you know? Find it. Still in her purse two days later, you know? But hey, you know, I, uh, you know, I need get paid, you know? A homeowner hired John to do a basement remodel and John found that all of his workers were now working for Curtis, working on the Raquel Falls Fellowship Baptist Church or the Rittmuller office suites. He had no choice but to tell the homeowner he could not do the job. Brian White, the attorney that John had hired for Rhonda, also insisted on being paid. Rhonda went to use one of her credit cards and found that Mike had canceled all of the cards, but grudgingly agreed to loan Rhonda the money. Honestly? Think I'd go tell Mike you're sorry, beg him forgive you. Bud grumbled to his daughter. Uh, seem to remember you married him. Promised forsake all others. Yeah, remember that well. I paid for that wedding. Michael Schiff, the court-appointed mediator, looked at the petition Rhonda had submitted, and the revised petition Mike had submitted, paperwork, looked over the bank statements, looked over the receipts, then listened to both arguments. His face took on a dark cast when Barbara Trenton played the tape of Mike complaining about lack of access to their children and Rhonda's smug reply that if he had signed the original petition he'd have more time with his children. So, Mrs. Morrison, the children are pawns? Want money? Use the children? Michael snapped. Uh, it's not like that, Brian White said. But Mrs. Morrison does have expenses. Mr. Morrison also has expenses. 
and Mr. Morrison has faithfully sent in his child support each month, Michael said, indicating Mike's bank statements. As for Mrs. Morrison's own expenses, might I suggest Mrs. Morrison get a job? Mike's 39th birthday was a month after the hollow victory in the mediation. He called Rhonda on her new cell phone, the cell phone John Piercy was paying for, and requested the children come with him to celebrate. Nothing fancy, just go to Benny's Burger Bar, you know? Mike said, forcing himself to sound cheerful. It still hurt to talk to his wife. Her betrayal was still quite raw. Rhonda had dressed up, had her hair done for the mediation and had looked good, beautiful. Your dad wants to take you guys to Benny's Burger Bar. It's his birthday, Rhonda snapped. Mike's heart broke when he heard his daughter whine. God, do I have to? Uh, Mike? Rhonda said, trying to think of an excuse. But the call had been terminated. Rhonda sighed and hit his number. She left a message when his voicemail picked up. Hey, guest call got dropped. You're probably still talking away, she said, forcing her voice to sound cheerful. Anyway, Michelle already had plans. Mickey does too. Maybe you guys can do something this weekend, huh? Friday afternoon, Rhonda waited for the phone call that Mike was on his way to pick up his children. Michelle was complaining about having to go. She had struck up a friendship with Caitlin Grady, the 13-year-old girl next door, and would rather be with her new friend than with her dorky dad. Mickey was just sullen moody. Whenever Rhonda asked him what was wrong, Mickey's answer was a terse nothing. 5.30 came and went. 6 o'clock ticked by, and still there was no call from Mike. At 6.30, Rhonda called Mike's phone and got the message that the number was no longer in service. Puzzled, she punched the number, 3, on her keypad again. Again, she got the message. About ready? John asked Rhonda, coming down the stairs in a dark suit. It looked like we're ready? Rhonda asked. Mike hasn't picked the kids up yet. Well, call the sucker, huh? John spat, handsome face twisted in anger. Gee, great idea, John. Why didn't I think of that? Rhonda snapped. Uh, oh wait, I did, and his number's not in service. Good, John gloated. So that a-hole's having a hard time too, huh? Come on, guys, Rhonda sighed, slipping her four-inch heels on. Get your stuff. We'll drop you guys off at your dad's. Was going take the vet, John complained. John, the clients will be inside, Rhonda said. They won't see the car. Come on. We're going to be late. John grumbled angrily, but grabbed the key for the Mercedes Benz. Michelle grumbled angrily as she got into the car. Mickey glowered angrily and got into the car. Oh my God, Rhonda gasped when she saw the gold standard real estate sign in front of Mike's house. Come on, come on, they're already there, John ordered Michelle and Mickey. Let's go get out, huh? John, they can't stay here. He's not here, Rhonda shrilled, seeing that none of the windows had curtains. So help me God. We screw this meeting up because of your goddamned kids, John hissed. John left a strip of rubber as he left the driveway. Speeding out of the neighborhood, John had to slam on the brakes when he nearly collided with a slow-moving car. John, meeting's not worth getting us all killed for, huh? Rhonda screamed. On the third of the month, Rhonda received a check for $800. The checks arrived every third of the month, unless the third was on a Sunday or a holiday. Then the check arrived on the second of the month. God, do I have to? Mike heard Michelle whine. He had also heard Mickey sullen. What? Why? Ending the call, Mike sat at the table and for the first time since his mother's death, he cried. He put his head onto his folded arms and sobbed. Ten minutes, ten hours later, he wasn't sure. Mike roused himself. Sluggishly, he got to his feet and looked around. Rhonda had already picked the house clean of anything of real monetary value. All that remained had some sentimental value. And Michelle and Mickey's reaction to a simple request that they spend some time with him on his birthday had erased much of the sentimental value of any remaining items. The consignment shop was happy to take much of the furniture. They even appreciated that Mike had loaded it all into his F-250 and brought it to them. The battered old recliner, they politely declined. Because of health concerns, they had to decline the mattresses as well. The dolls, the superhero action figures, the roller skates and ice skates, they were sure would go quickly. As it was, a customer was already pouring through one of the boxes. Lyle Curtis let a few real expletives slip when Mike told him he was leaving Raquel Falls, was leaving Colorado. The two men shared a manly hug and a few of the crew also shook Mike's hand, or gave him hugs as well. Where are you going go? A few asked as they looked at the travel trailer hitched to his truck. Probably south, Mike shrugged. I mean, it's still summer now, but man, tired of freezing my boys off in the winter, you know? What? Ain't like you using them anyway, 
one of the men said and Mike smiled and shook his head. Barbara Trenton named a reasonable retainer fee and agreed to act as power of attorney in the sale of his home. The gold standard real estate agent had been out to the home and had assured Mike she could easily get 130, possibly even 140 for the home, despite the recent housing market collapse. Because Mike had paid for the home fully, the full sales price, minus the agent's commission would go into his account. The real estate agent upgraded her thoughts after Lyle Curtis had a crew go to Mike's house and repaint the entire home and put a new carpet throughout the house. We'll list it for 160, she enthused when Mike answered his cell phone. Okay, Mike said, having no idea that Lyle had done what he'd done. Mike Morrison picked up the decree of divorce in Oakleaf, Texas. To celebrate, Mike went to Tijuana Jack's, had a half-pound burger, some very spicy fries and two ice-cold draft beers. He even had a $50 lap dance from an innocent-faced red head with pneumatic breasts. Mike had no trouble finding work. Scanduro Construction called Lyle Curtis. Lyle confirmed that Mike was not only as good as he claimed, he was actually better than he claimed to be. The pay was good, the work was steady and the crew knew what they were doing. But the nights were long. Working from 7 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon, for in the afternoon if they had a deadline to meet kept Mike busy. But the moment the boss called the end to the day and everyone else went home, Mike was again reminded that he had no home. He was living in his travel trailer, in a RV park. Mike took to remaining after, just to clean up the site. He'd gather all the nails, the scrap boards, sweep up the sawdust, the metal filings. Mike, day's over, Joe Tonicetti said quietly one afternoon. Uh-huh, Mike said, sweeping the concrete foundation. Wife's got her world-famous meatloaf and red gravy. Why you don't come on over? Joe said. Thanks, but I think I'll. Mike said, man, hurts my feelings, you going say no to Catherine Marie's meatloaf? Joe said, need run on home, take a shower, Mike said after a long moment. Then do it, Joe ordered. Reach 1217 Ferguson Drive here? Okay, Mike agreed. The home was a fairly large home among other fairly large homes. The neighborhood reminded Mike of the neighborhood in Raquel Falls, Colorado. He again felt the pangs of homesickness as he parked on the curb. Catherine Marie Tonicetti was a French-Canadian. Where Joe was dark and lanky, Catherine Marie was plump and pale. But the two seemed to be in constant contact with one another. They touched hands, they patted one another, their hips rubbed against one another. Joe sat at the head of the table, Catherine Marie sat to his right. Their oldest child, a 20-year-old daughter, sat to Joe's left. To the left of Antoinette, Tony Tonicetti sat Joey, Joe's 15-year-old son. To Catherine Marie's right sat Cheryl, the 17 year old daughter. Tony looked almost identical to her mother, but Joey and Cheryl looked a great deal like Joe, except both Joey and Cheryl did pack on a few extra pounds. The meal was a loud, raucous affair. The only sedate moment was when Joe said the prayer. Mike found out that Joey was on the football team of Saints Peter and Paul High School. Cheryl was already a senior at Sacred Ascension and planned to go to the University of Louisiana at DeGarde, planning to major in biosynthetic engineering. Must get it from her mama, Mike. Joe smiled proudly. Damn sure don't get it from her old man. Tony, you're mighty quiet, Catherine Marie asked. I, uh, I'm starting my last year of college. Education, Tony mumbled, not looking up from her broccoli and cheese. Comes home from her first day of kindergarten, says I'm going to be a teacher, and ain't never thought being nothing else, Joe bragged. Mike thought of Michelle. She decided she was going to be an Olympic skier, until she found out they didn't really make a great deal of money and had to train daily. Then she decided she was going to be a doctor, but decided, after a few weeks, that being a doctor was too hard. The last thing Mike remembered Michelle saying she wanted to be was a meteorologist. The weather girl on their local station was a gorgeous, but ditzy young woman. You don't even have know what you're doing. She just reads everything off a computer screen, Michelle claimed. Need good teachers, Mike agreed. Remember what it was made you decide you was going to be a teacher? I, uh, Miss Davis was so pretty and she was so smart. Tony looked up finally smiling. She talked all about the world outside of Texas and There ain't no world outside Texas, Tony, Joe interrupted. Hate tell you this, but Miss Davis lied. When I asked her how to be a teacher, she told me I had to really want it and I had to do real good in school, Tony said, swatting her father's arm. Valedictorian at Sacred Ascension, been on the dean's list every semester, Catherine Marie bragged. Do you have any kids, Mr. Mike? Tony asked fixing Mike with her clear green eyes. I got, had too, Mike said, losing his smile. Had, Joey asked, giggling. Lost them somewhere? Tony slapped her brother on the back of his head, hard. Hey, Joey cried out. 
Kind of did, Mike answered. Divorce. Sorry, Joey mumbled, chastened. Shortly after the dishes had been cleared away, Mike yawned, then laughed and apologized. He thanked Catherine Marie for having him at her table, wished Tony, Joey, and Cheryl a good night, then surprised Joe by gripping the man in a powerful hug. Been a while, Joe, he said. Been a while since I sat at a kitchen table like that. The next day, Joe gave no indication that Mike had been a guest at his home. He barked orders, he pointed, he yelled, and at three o'clock he called an end to the day. Mike stayed behind and cleaned up the area. He was disappointed when Joe didn't come back, didn't order him to join him and his family for another meal. Tijuana Jacks served Mike a juicy burger and an ice-cold draft. On Friday, Joe barked orders, he yelled, he pointed. At 2.30, he handed out paychecks. Tomorrow night? Catherine Marie's making this stuff? Calls it jambalaya, Joe said after everyone else had scattered. What time you want me there? Mike asked. Six, Joe said. But hey, uh, tonight? Joey's playing. Why you don't come? Mike sat on hard bleachers and clapped and whistled for Saints Peter and Paul. St. Andrew soundly trounced the home team, but it was an energetic field. Tony sat next to Mike during the game, dressed in cut-off denim shorts, in a Saints Peter and Paul football jersey. She touched him on his hand, his arm, a few times on his thigh. Her chubby leg brushed against his leg often. At 5 o'clock Saturday afternoon, Mike went to Burns and Burns Supermarket and bought a nice strawberry shortcake. He then drove around, trying to kill time. Finally, he pulled onto Ferguson Drive and parked in front of the house. Hey, Mr. Mike, Cheryl smiled when she opened the door. Dad, Mr. Mike's here. Going make him stand outside? Joe asked. Well, no, Cheryl said. Then move your butt out the way. Let him in, Joe teased his daughter. Catherine Marie accepted the cake, complaining that she didn't need cake. She thanked him again as she placed it into the refrigerator. But I really don't need it, Catherine Marie said, patting her slight paunch. Then don't eat it, Joe suggested. Oh, but that would be so rude. He is our guest, and he brings us a cake and I don't eat it? Catherine Marie smiled. Uh-huh, Joe smiled as he hugged her from behind. Joe, we have a guest, Catherine Marie complained as Joe's hands went underneath her heavy breasts. Mike, turn around, huh? This won't take but a minute, Joe ordered. Joe, leave me alone, Catherine Marie squealed then giggled. They do that all the time, Tony said rolling her eyes. What married people supposed do, Mike smiled. Tony's blush was quite adorable. The twenty-year-old turned and left the kitchen. Where are you going? Supper's just bout ready, Joe called out. My room, Tony called back. How about you set the table? Joe ordered. Hey, I can do that, Mike said. What? You are guest, Joe said. No, first time I was a guest. Second time? I'm a member of the family, Mike said. Now, which one has the plates? Tony showed up after Mike opened the cabinet. Together, she and Mike set the table. She then grabbed a handful of knives and forks. Mike quickly folded six paper towels into squares, and she put the silverware down onto the napkins. I'll let you get the glasses and ice, Mike said. Hey, Mr. Mike, Joey said. We played like dog poop last night, huh? Thought you guys played fine, Mike smiled. Too bad other team came to win, huh? Talk about, huh? Timmy Elmont? They're running back? Joey agreed. Mike found out that jambalaya, as Catherine Marie made it, was just chopped up pieces of chicken and pork sausage mixed together with rice and simmered in a covered skillet with a can of diced tomatoes and finely chopped onions and bell peppers. There was a healthy amount of cayenne pepper added for extra kick and Mike fought hard against making a pig of himself. Ooh, you brought dessert? Joey hooped when Catherine Marie mentioned the strawberry shortcake. Yes, but I don't need it, Catherine Marie again stated. Good. More for me, Joey declared. Son, got a lot learn about women, Mike said, smiling. Sunday was a long day for Mike. He'd never been particularly religious so did not attend any church service. He knew football well enough to follow it, but wasn't wild about any team, even the Denver Broncos. He tried to sleep a little later than normal, but soon gave up and got up. He didn't bother taking a shower, just dressed in shorts and t-shirt and sneakers and left the travel trailer. Some of the neighbors in the mobile park waved in greeting, others did not. Mike walked for a few miles, until he came to Oxbow Lake. There, he saw a few others that were of the same temperament as himself. They were not in church, they were not glued to a television set. They were not willing to stay indoors, alone with their thoughts. One young lady caught his attention. She was a stunning blonde whose skin was nearly brown. She was so tanned. She peered around herself, eyes hidden by sunglasses. 
but she was obviously looking around to see if anyone was looking at her. The young woman was making sure she had an audience, a throng of admirers, but no one was paying her any attention. They were busy with their frisbee game, busy with their beach ball, busy with their own tans. That's how I feel too, Mike said when the attractive blonde visibly slumped. Monday morning, Mike and Carlos completed the trim work. Now, there was nothing to do while the painters slapped on a coat of primer, slapped on a coat of stark white demi-gloss. The electricians did their rough ends. Carlos shrugged with Mike grabbed broom and dustpan. Hey Morrison, Joe hollered. Yeah, Mike asked. My Tony? Wants know if you're coming over for dinner tonight, Joe snapped, face hard. I, uh, I guess, Mike said, puzzled at Joe's tone, Joe's expression. Man, listen, huh? She's only 20, huh? Joe snapped. She's half old as you. Hey, hey, nah, uh, Joe, I ain't done nothing, Mike protested. Joe stared at him, hard. Then Joe turned on his heel and started yelling orders at the Sheetrock men that were slowly taping the seams. Come on, come on. Need roll these walls, huh? He barked. Mike shrugged, leaned broom and dustpan against the door jam, and left the job site. The project was finished as far as his work was concerned. He could stick around, do the cleanup, the touch-up work, those last little odds and ends before a business could move in. Or he could leave that work to Carlos and Carlos's cousin Philip. Barbara Trenton looked over the receipts, rapidly tapped on the keypad of her computer keyboard, and nodded her head. She then turned her attention to Rhonda. So, half of. She started. I, uh, there any way you could, uh, chip in a little more? Rhonda whined. Barbara fought down the wince. Rhonda's voice grated on her nerves. The attorney studied the attractive woman for a moment, then shook her head. Divorce was pretty cut and dry, Barbara snapped. 400 a month per minor child and half of medical and education expenses. Yeah, but, I mean, car died, had to get a new one and... Rhonda complained. Mrs. Piercy, Barbara started. It's Morrison. Rhonda snapped. I'm interesting, Barbara quipped. Mrs. Morrison, your failure to plan is not my client's concern. And where is your client, huh? Rhonda demanded. Missed Michelle's birthday. We sent her a birthday card, Barbara stated. Sent a $10 gift card for Benny's Burger Bar with it. Barbara's personal assistant brought the printed check in and Barbara signed the check. She slid the check across the desk to Rhonda Piercy, or Morrison. Barbara then placed the receipts into the plastic grocery bag Rhonda had used to carry the receipts into the office. Thank you, Mrs. Piercy. I apologize, Mrs. Morrison, Barbara said, returning her attention to her computer monitor. So, Michelle's braces? Rhonda snapped. What? Michael A. Morrison, Sr. has paid his half for those. He has paid his half for Michael A. Morrison Jr.'s soccer camp. He has paid his half for the dental visits, Barbara said. Could you at least tell me how get in touch with him? Rhonda pleaded. No, Barbara said icily and again turned her attention to her computer monitor. Bitch, I hope one day you have kids of your own and have to put up with a bitch like you, Rhonda snapped. Have three of my own. Raised them on my own after my husband left us and did just fine, Barbara replied, typing on her keyboard. Gee, I wonder why your husband left you, Rhonda sniped. Found a selfish little bitch that didn't threaten his male ego by earning her own way in life, Barbara said, still typing. But don't worry. After she bled him dry, he tried to come back. All apologies and sweetness and it'll never happen again. So, know it well, I am a made woman and unlike you. I work hard for what I want. I don't open my legs to get what I want. Now get out. Hello? Mike answered his cell phone. Now Catherine Marie's asking if you coming to dinner, Joe's voice snapped. It's chicken cacciatore, or what she thinks is chicken cacciatore. Ain't nothing like my mama used to make, that's for sure. I, uh... I don't think so, but... Mike said. You don't come. I'm in deep trouble, Joe said. Six o'clock. Hear me? Mike pulled up to the home, making sure not to block the driveway with the travel trailer. Tony answered the door, smiling up at him. Then she saw the shining trailer behind Mike. Her green eyes opened wide. Oh, you're going camping, she asked, smiling. No, I am moving on, Mike admitted. Tony jerked her head and looked at Mike's hard face. Her eyes filled with tears, and she dashed into the dark interior of the house. What the? Catherine Marie, what's wrong with her? Joe demanded. Come on in. Mike, letting all the cold out, huh? Catherine Marie greeted Mike with a smile. Joey had already set the table, and Cheryl was grabbing the glasses. Tony, it's ready. Catherine Marie yelled out as she served out the meal. Tony. Catherine Marie demanded a moment later as she took her seat at the table. 
Antoinette, Catherine Marie Tonicetti. Catherine Marie yelled as she stood up. She uses your full name. You know you're in trouble, Joey said to Mike. Then don't tell her my full name, Mike joked. I'll go get her, Cheryl offered. Joe, say Grace. I'll go get her, Catherine Marie ordered. The four people hesitated. When Joe started eating, then Cheryl, Joey, and Mike started to eat as well. A moment later, two plump, beautiful blonde women came into the kitchen and took their seats. Both women had reddened eyes. So, Mike, why you leaving? Catherine Marie demanded. I, uh, I mean the job's done, right? Mike stammered as Joe's head jerked up from his plate. We just started rolling it today, Joe said. But my job's done, Mike pointed out. Framing's done. Uh huh, but we fixing start on Great Oak National Bank Monday after next, Joe argued. Mr. Mike, Michael, please stay, Tony whispered, staring intently at her plate. She swiveled her head. Her green eyes were swimming in tears. She mouthed please at him, then looked at her plate again. Five years later, Rhonda Morrison looked up and down Robert's Drive. The homes in this section of the Texas town were stunning. 18, 18, 1809, Rhonda muttered, stopping the rental car in front of the red brick home. Uh-huh, Rhonda smirked, seeing the shiny travel trailer on the side of the house. When Mike had bought that monstrosity, she had demanded that he pour a concrete pad for it. She wasn't having dead grass patches or weeds overgrown around something that they'd never ever in a million years actually use. It was perched on a concrete pad next to the large garage. Rhonda looked at the neatly manicured lawn, the lively flowers in the cute wooden wheelbarrow in the center of the yard, the gay flowers along the walkway from driveway to front door. She did smirk at the flowers. Mike had never cared one bit about such things. He had said on more than one occasion that flowers were nothing but desirable weeds. Stealing herself, Rhonda approached the front door and pushed the lighted button. Yes, a disembodied female voice called out. Rhonda looked at the small speaker and saw now that she was on camera. A small lens sat at the top of the metal grill. I, uh, hi, I'm Mike. Does Mike Morrison live here? Rhonda said, flustered. And you are? The female voice asked. It wasn't an unfriendly voice. It wasn't a welcoming voice either. Rhonda grew agitated. This wasn't how this had played out in her mind. She had splurged on her travel outfit. The jersey material clung to her 36D breasts. The push-up bra lifted them nicely. The same clinging material did, unfortunately, highlight her paunch, but she was 39 years old. That couldn't be helped. The jeans did encase her hips nicely. There were a few extra pounds on them, and the hips and the thighs. Her backside was a little wider than she would have liked, but the jeans did squeeze all of her flesh into a somewhat more attractive display. Now, Standing on his door stoop, the Texas sun beating down on her. The jeans were sodden with sweat and now chafed her plump thighs, her prominent waistline. The blouse was sticking to her more than it was clinging to her. I, uh, I'm his, I'm Rhonda. Rhonda Morrison, his wife. His ex-wife, Rhonda said. Oh, the voice exclaimed. He didn't. Does he know you? Did he know you were coming? Uh, no, Rhonda admitted. For several moments she stood. Just when she was about to ring the bell again, the door opened. It wasn't fair. Seven and a half years later, he wasn't supposed to be looking even better than he had looked when she left him. But he did look good better. His blonde hair had streaks of silver. His face was bronzed by the sun. His chest and arms bulged in the tank top he wore. He was wearing swim trunks and his legs were thick, bulging with muscles, and his waist looked slim. Yes, he demanded. Hello, Mike, Rhonda said, then smirked. Long time no see. Yes? Mike demanded again. I, uh, I. Mike, there's somewhere we can talk? Rhonda stammered. Right here's fine, Mike said. Michael, a beautiful young blonde, said gently. Rhonda looked from Mike's hard face to the blonde woman. The young woman had long blonde hair, beautiful green eyes, and a gentle expression on her face. Mike and whoever this woman was had most likely been swimming. The young blonde had a small wrap covering her from just under her armpits to just below her crotch. Her arms were slim, her legs sleek, and the wrap jutted substantially away from her chest. Michael, y'all go to the sunroom, the young woman said, voice soft but rich with her Texas twang. Precious, I don't want her in my house, Mike said, voice hard. Michael, the woman said, peering into his brown eyes. Five minutes. Fine, come on, Mike ordered Rhonda. The woman scampered toward what Rhonda presumed was the sunroom, then opened the atrium doors and stepped outside. Through the large glass window, Rhonda could see a large swimming pool, and in the swimming pool was a Hispanic-looking girl and a young girl and two young boys. 
Rhonda watched as the blonde removed her wrap and stepped down into the pool. Her mouth opened at the sight of the blonde's body. Five minutes, let's go Rhonda. Start talking, Mike ordered. Tearing Rhonda's attention from the attractive blonde that now sat on the steps and played with the three children. Really? Rhonda spat bitterly now. We were together for 14 years. Can't be a little nicer to me? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like a glass of champagne? Some caviar? Golly gosh, where are my manners? Mike snapped sarcastically. Come on, Rhonda. Came all the way out here. Let's get to it. I, uh, I don't know if you heard, uh, but, uh, Michelle's getting married next month. The ninth, Rhonda said. Yeah? How far along is she? Mike asked. Rhonda colored at Mike's blunt question. She looked toward the swimming pool again. For in a half months, she finally admitted. Hmm, was Mike's response. I, uh, she'd really, it would mean so much if her daddy would walk her down the aisle, Rhonda said. God, do I have to? Mike spat bitterly. Well, I, uh, I mean she'd really, Rhonda stammered, puzzled at his statement. Wanna go to Benny's Burger Bar, Mike explained his snipe. Hey, it's my birthday, wanna spend a little time with my kids. And what do I hear? God, do I have to? So, no, Rhonda, I won't be walking Michelle down the aisle. Tell her to get John Piercy do that, all right? What else you got? I, uh, John Piercy's no longer a part of our lives, Rhonda snapped, pretty face becoming twisted, ugly. Hmm, Mike responded. Mike turned in time to see the little girl bravely jump from the diving board into the swimming pool. He smiled as the two women applauded the girl's achievement. The girl swam from the deep end of the pool to the ladder. Before either woman could stop the small girl, she ran to the atrium doors. Daddy, you seen me? The girl shrieked, dripping water everywhere. Yeah, I seen you. You jumped from the board, right into the deep end, just like a big girl, Mike said, picking the wet child up and hugging her. I'm Audrey, I'm four, the girl said to Rhonda. Hello, Rhonda said. Michael, I'm sorry, she ran in here before I could stop her, the blonde woman said, entering the room. My mommy's a teacher, Audrey said proudly. Oh, Rhonda said. Precious, it's fine. She didn't disturb anything, Mike smiled and gave his daughter a big squeeze. Come on, sweetheart, show mommy that big old jump again, okay? The woman cajoled. Daddy, you need watch, Audrey demanded. Like I could ever take my eyes off of you? Mike smiled and gave her another squeeze. So, why can't Mickey walk his sister down the aisle? Mike asked watching as Audrey stepped out onto the diving board again. I, he, Rhonda stammered. I mean, I know he's out of the treatment center. Just how crappy is your insurance anyway? Didn't pay Penny one for his CDU? Mike asked, smiling as Audrey did jump into the water again. What insurance? Rhonda spat bitterly. Because I know, paid 28,000 first time. And that was just my half, paid 31 second time. And this one was what? 38,5, my half, Mike said. Rhonda looked pointedly around the sunroom, at the rot-tan furniture, the Spanish tiles, the large backyard with swimming pool. Quit sending him to country clubs, Mike demanded. Frankie's boy got clean and sober at the charity ward, and has been clean and sober coming up on nine years now. Rhonda glared angrily at Mike. He obviously had no idea of the guilt she'd been carrying around for the past four years. Rhonda Piercy had come home. Thoroughly humiliated when the snotty bitch at her spin class had let her know that she'd not received the payment. Rhonda knew she'd typed all the information, knew she'd hit send, and had confirmation from the online banking site that the payment had been sent. Rhonda had stormed up the stairs to find John, to complain about the snafu. Entering her, their bedroom, Rhonda saw John, and she saw her 13-year-old son in the bedroom with John. Mickey told the police that it had been going on since the second night that they'd moved into John's house. Mickey also told the police that John had told him that Rhonda knew all about it. Shortly after the discovery, shortly after John's arrest, shortly after the divorce, Mickey started skipping school, started staying out late, started coming home with glassy eyes, alcohol on his breath. The first treatment center was after Rhonda came home to the shitty little two-bedroom apartment and found Mickey unconscious, needle still sticking in his arm. Her job at Myra's boutique was strictly commission versus base. She couldn't afford the insurance and rent and utilities and groceries. Three years later, she was still paying off her half of the bill from that treatment center. He, uh, Mickey's in jail, Rhonda admitted. I wonder if I still have to pay you child support if he's in jail, Mike wondered aloud as he watched his wife, the maid, and the three children toweling off. He's still a minor, Rhonda snapped. Uh-huh, but you don't have him in your custody, do you? 
Mike said, getting to his feet. Five minutes is up, Rhonda. See you. Really? Really? I flew all this way. Beg you be a part of your daughter's wedding? And you're just going shit all over me? Rhonda shrilled. Uh, did I ask you to come here? Mike asked. No, Michelle did. Rhonda snarled. Then maybe Michelle should have come, Mike said and opened the door of the sunroom. Hey guys, you all waterlogged? Uh-huh. My fingers are all bumpy, Audrey announced. Oh, that's terrible, Mike said. Well, you seem to have done all right for yourself, Rhonda snarled bitterly at Mike. Uh-huh. No thanks to you, Mike smiled. Mike ushered Rhonda to the front door of the home. Neither one said a word as he closed the heavy door behind her. Walking from door to car, Rhonda again felt the sweat begin around her waist, underneath her armpits. Inside the home, Mike was entering the kitchen where there was a mild riot going on. His wife and their maid were trying to decipher what the children wanted for dinner. Boogers and toes? Mike suggested. Don't get them started, the blonde smiled. Daddy, I want hot dogs, Russell said. Yeah, hot dogs, Bertrand, Russell's twin brother echoed. Now, wait a minute. Carmen, the housekeeper laughed. I thought you said you wanted hamburgers? I changed my mind, the boy stated. How about spaghetti? With hot dogs cut up in it. Mike suggested. Yeah, three children agreed. Daddy, you the best. His wife smiled as she dug out the pot for the pasta. After dinner, after baths, even though Russell and then Bertrand stated they'd already been in the pool, that should count as a bath. After praying and reading bedtime stories, Mike walked into his bedroom. Hey, precious. Mike said as his wife came out of the closet, dressed in a simple t-shirt. Now, what did your ex-wife want? She asked, kissing him. Want to know how you can look so good, even after being stuck with an old man all this time? Mike smiled. Plenty of protein. She smiled and crawled onto the bed. Now, come on, really. What did she want? Wanted me walk my daughter down the aisle. Michelle's getting married next month. On the 9th, Mike said, following her into the bed. So. We going up to Raquel Falls? She asked, smiling happily. It's snowing up there yet? In August? No, precious, despite what you Southerners might think, Colorado's nowhere near the North Pole. Mike smiled. And no, we're not going. You think you going up there by yourself? That's not happening, she snapped. Not going, Mike said. Michael, your daughter? You, you're not going walk her. She sputtered. She put her blonde head on his chest. Her fingers gently rubbed his muscled chest. He wrapped his right arm around her. Baby, I know, I know what happened. I know it hurt, but... She whispered. She picked her head up, her green eyes searching his eyes. He moved to kiss her but she backed up. Mike remembered the first time he had seen her. She had been a beautiful girl then. Six, almost seven years later, she was still beautiful. He and Tony had gone on a few dates. The girl was beautiful and her body was pleasingly plump. She was intelligent thoughtful, exuberant and fun. He cared for her, cared for her very much, but there simply was no spark, no real chemistry. The sex was terrific, exhausting. Tony loved it all. But again, there was no real connection, other than two lonely people using each other. Thankfully, it had been Tony to bring up the painful truth. Michael, she said as they walked around Kennedy Park, along Oxbow Lake. Uh-huh, he asked, watching a woman with one of those ankle-biter dogs. The woman had a nice, tight-looking backside. She was wearing boy shorts, strutting and showing off that tight-looking rear end. The Yorkie was on a retractable leash. Mike was fascinated, watching the dog scampering around. Leash line zipping in and out of the clunky-looking handle the woman gripped. Michael, I love you, Tony said. Mike felt his guts not up. He knew he was not in love with the girl. He cared for her, but not enough to see any real future with her. I, uh, but, I'm just not in love with you, she admitted. Kind of how I'm feeling too, Mike admitted. I mean, good golly, I care a lot about you. But do I see any long-term romance here? Probably not. Oh, Tony said. But I know we'll always be friends, Mike said. I mean, I know I owe you one thing. You kept me from just running off, just because things got a little hard. She smiled up at him. He put his arm around her chubby body and gave her a squeeze. Come on, let's get you home, huh? He said. Just then... The Yorkie started yapping and squealing. The woman yelled the animal's name. Mike looked over and saw the small dog charging at a jogger. The jogger apparently did not see the retractable line. The dog's leash because the jogger suddenly found herself wrapped up in the thin, strong line. The jogger went down, hard. 
the dog started squealing and screeching, trapped underneath the jogger's prone body. The woman started screaming at the hapless jogger. Mike rushed over and gently assisted the jogger. He then grabbed the now snarling six-pound dog, unhooked the leash and thrust the annoying dog at the dog's annoying owner. Hold your damned animal and drop the stupid leash, Mike ordered. He managed to work the line loose. The entire time, the jogger had not moved. Mike could see the swelling knot on the woman's forehead. He could also see the break in the woman's ankle. Concussion, broken leg, Mike said. Tony, get her name and address. I'm not giving you. The woman shrilled. Mike pulled his cell phone out, snapped two pictures of the woman, then called 911. Yes, got a jogger here, broken ankle, looks like a possible concussion. Woman's dog tripped her, caused the... My Dawson didn't trip her. She just fell, the woman loudly protested. Bitch please, Mike spat at the woman. Okay sir, I can get an ambulance. It'll be about 40 minutes, the operator intoned. She's unconscious, Mike protested. I'm sorry sir, the nearest vehicle is in Wakulla, the operator said. Never mind, I'll get her there myself, Mike snapped. He picked the young woman up and carried her to his truck. Tony followed behind, glaring at the woman and the woman's dog. The woman made a hasty retreat. Don't worry, got her picture. She'll be back, Mike told Tony as he strapped the woman into his truck. Tony ran and picked up a cup of ice from a vendor, and Mike gave Tony his handkerchief. Tony sat in the jump seat behind the young woman and held the improvised ice pack to the woman's head as Mike drove rapidly, hazard lights flashing, to Lowridge's hospital. The woman moaned softly a few times, but was still unconscious when Mike screeched to a halt outside of the ER. A nurse and an orderly came outside rapidly pushing a gurney. Mike told them what had happened as they loaded the young woman onto the gurney. Then he drove Tony home. They hugged one more time. Then Tony wiped a tear from her eye and went into her parents' home. Mike debated with himself on whether he should go back to the hospital or just go on home. The lateness of the hour made the decision for him. He had a full day tomorrow, work the day for Scanduro, and work on his latest foreclosure tomorrow evening. The night they had chicken cacciatore, the night Tony begged Mike to stay, he decided he needed to find more permanent lodgings than his travel trailer. While Mike waited for Scanduro Construction to complete the Adams office suites and begin work on the Great Oak First National Bank, Mike came across a foreclosure in a modest neighborhood and purchased the property. The owners had left food to rot, had smeared feces on the walls, had broken all the windows and dumped dry concrete into the toilets. Mike did much of the work himself, using his position with Scanduros to get the materials at a good price. While he was working on that home, the home next door was also seized. Mike bought that home as well. Then two homes on Roberts Drive, a gated community, also went into foreclosure. The owners had overextended their credit, had used their homes as collateral. The collapsing market had caught them unaware. Mike was able to unload three of the four properties at a reasonable return. He decided he would move into the fourth home, 1809, Roberts Drive. He worked for Scanduro Construction during the day, Morrison Renovation and Reconstruction in the evenings and on the weekends. His latest project was inside of the same gated community, on Simpson Way. The story was the same. The owner had overextended themselves on a speculation that did not pan out and had lost the home. The man's final act had been to hang himself in the home. That had been the man's trophy wife's first indication that anything was wrong in her idyllic life. Nora Sanford first emptied her husband's wall safe, grabbing all of her jewelry. She made sure she also had the keys to the three safe deposit boxes, then she called 911 to report Jack's suicide. In the morning, the moment Jack Sanford's bank opened, Nora emptied the three safe deposit boxes and disappeared. The bank had been slow to seize all other assets, but seize them they did. The house was the last piece of the estate, and Mike picked it up at a fifth of the estimated value. The only thing he really needed to do was change the carpet and the paint. Either Jack, or more likely Nora, had very loud, very gaudy taste in color schemes, color combinations. The electric blue carpet and the magenta carpet were first to be yanked out. It took three coats of kilts to cover the gold enamel paint on the bathroom walls. But after Joe called an end to the work day, Mike found himself driving out to Lowridge instead of to the Simpson Way property. He parked and entered the hospital, then realized he did not even know the young woman's name. A nurse typed into a keyboard, looked at Mike, looked at his driver's license, then looked again. Far way to drive, huh? She asked. Hmm? Oh. Only been in Oakleaf a few months, Mike admitted. I'll see if she's up for a visitor, the nurse said and walked briskly away. A few moments later, the nurse returned, smiling widely. She directed Mike to the fourth floor, the south wing. Left when you get out the elevator, 
she instructed. They cut up my shoe, get it off, was the first thing the woman said when Mike entered the room. Guess none of them figured out how to untie a knot. When I brought you in, that was the first thing I asked them, Mike smiled, looking into her clear green eyes. They weren't sure, but they thought there might be a doctor knew how to a knot. Tell me what happened. I'm just jogging along, then, nothing, the woman said. Woman had one of them ankle biters on one of those goofy zip line leashes, Mike said, taking a chair. You came along and frou frou, or snookums, or whatever the little bitch's name is charged you. You got all tangled up and down you went. Looking at the blonde as they chatted, Mike couldn't help but get the feeling he had seen her before. He even mentioned that to her. She studied his face for a long moment, then shook her head. I was going Connolly, she offered. Oh yeah? What you studying? He asked. Education. Want to be a teacher, she said. Maybe that's where I know you. Did pick Tony up there a few times? Mike shrugged. Um, by the way, you got a name, she asked. Huh? Oh, Mike. Mike Morrison, he said. Precious Cruz, she said. Yeah, yeah, I know, I don't look Mexican. So, Precious, anyone you need to call, he asked and her beautiful face clouded over. I, uh, no, I, uh, she stammered, looking away. Mother? Father? he pressed. Mom died last, ovarian cancer, she said. Dad said you ain't my kid. Either screw or get out, Precious said. Oh, Mike said. He looked at his watch and decided he only had another two hours of sunlight left to work in. He told Precious he'd be back and stood. She smiled sadly and lowered her bed again. Even in the shapeless hospital gown, when she lay back, Mike could see her amazing body. And he remembered where he had seen her before. Oxbow Lake, he said. Huh. Precious asked, pausing the bed's momentum. That's where I've seen you before. On the beach at Oxbow Lake, Mike explained. Precious immediately moved to make sure her gown's hem was covering her crotch. She blushed hotly. No, no, you were there, sunbathing, Mike said. Beautiful girl, in a beautiful green bikini, but looking about as sad as I felt. What you got feel sad about? Precious asked. Mike took the seat again. Precious raised the bed again and looked at him. I, uh, I was happily married, had two kids, boy and girl, wanted to name him Russell, after my old man God, my old man was the greatest, you hear? Mike said, either that, or Bertrand, that was my mom's dad, give him a piece of wood, he'd take out his pocket knife, and in minutes, you had a car, or a frog, or a boat, so, what did you name him? Precious asked softly, taking his hand into hers, Rhonda, that was my wife, Rhonda decided on Mike Jr. called him Mickey, Mike said. That's a good name, Precious smiled. I like that name. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good name. I mean, I was named after my dad's brother. Died in Nam, Mike agreed. And your little girl? Precious asked. Audrey, Mike said. Oh, I love that name. Precious enthused. Hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was my mom's name, Audrey Nicole McAllister Morrison, Mike said. But once again, Rhonda decided on something else. Michelle. Michelle Christina Morrison. Said it was cute. Michael and Michelle? You see them a lot? She asked. Been a few months now, Mike admitted. They're up in Raquel Falls. They got a swimming pool and a boogie board and what do they need with their dad, huh? Mike stayed until an orderly brought her dinner into the room. Mike surprised them both when he leaned over and gently kissed Precious on her lips. The next morning, Mike was completing what would be the main load-bearing wall in the bank's main lobby. His pocket vibrated and chimed out back in black by ACDC. Michael, a soft voice asked. Uh-huh, Mike agreed, wiping the sweat from his face. It was just after 10 o'clock and already the Texas sun was broiling. Mike walked over to the cooler and grabbed a paper cup. Michael, they're discharging me today, Precious said. Be there, they at least going feed you lunch? Mike asked, sweeping his eyes around the site, trying to locate Joe. No, they already got me out in the hall, she admitted. Oh, for crying out loud, really? Mike spat. Be there as soon as I can. Joe shrugged his shoulders when Mike informed him he had a bit of an emergency. At the hospital, an orderly wheeled Precious to the curb. Mike lifted the girl and put her into his truck then helped her buckle up. Okay, where am I taking you? He asked. Home, she said. She gave him directions to the Spanish Arms Apartments. Then she remembered. Her car was still at Kennedy Park. Mike shrugged off her apologies and drove to Kennedy Park. She pointed out the 2005 Volkswagen Beetle and slapped his arm when he mocked the tiny car. Shut up. It's cute, she defended, laughing. He made a sound like a wasp humming and buzzing as he parked next to the vehicle. 
Then he came around and helped her out of his truck. Uh, things not a stick, huh? Mike asked. Well, yeah, Precious said. Mike looked at the plaster boot on her leg. She looked down, then realized. She'd find driving her car extremely difficult. Okay, your apartment's not that far. I'll drop you off, then drive it over there, Mike decided. Oh, Michael, that's too much, Precious argued. Precious, you can't drive like that, Mike said. And we can't leave it here. Pulling up to the Spanish arms again, Mike saw a new problem. Precious lived on the third floor. Precious, ah shit, they didn't give you any crutches? Mike asked. Huh? No, they didn't, Precious realized. Honey, how are you going to get up and down them stairs? Mike asked. I don't know, Precious said and burst into tears. Okay, come on, get your key out, Mike ordered. He carried her up to her apartment. Then he left her in the dank, sweltering apartment. He drove to Burns and Burns Supermarket and grabbed a few boxes. What? What are those for? Precious asked when she managed to hobble to the door and open it for Mike. Pack clothes, toothbrush, whatever you need for the next couple of weeks, Mike ordered. You're staying with me. At least, until you can get around on your own. Precious was about to argue. Then she thought about it for a moment. Just hopping from couch to door had been a struggle. How was she going to hop from couch, or bed to door, out the door, and down to the ground floor of her apartment building? I assume your apartment is on the ground floor? She asked as he carried the boxes into her bedroom. Yours will be, Mike assured her as he looked around the neat, orderly bedroom. Listen, give me the keys to your beetle bug and I'll be back, okay? Oh, Precious teased. Don't want help me pack? No, I've seen enough of women's drawers last me a lifetime, Mike smiled. Again, he surprised Precious by leaning forward and giving her a light kiss on her lips. Then he left the apartment. Mike drove down to a gas station and rented a hitch and harness. Then he drove to the park and affixed the hitch to the car's front end. Unbelievable, Mike smiled as he drove away. The truck acted like it felt nothing. The truck pulled the small car as if it wasn't even there. Okay, think I'm ready, Precious said. Okay, Mike said and hefted her into his arms. He carried her down to the truck. Then he trotted back up the stairs and got the boxes. All right, anything else? He asked her before he picked her up to put her into his truck. Nope, she smiled, then surprised him with a kiss, directly on his lips. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mike smiled and jogged back upstairs to make sure he locked her apartment securely. So, said my apartment's on the ground? How many apart? Precious asked. Yeah, well, your bedroom is. It's a three-story house, but other than to paint it? Change the carpets? I've not been on the third floor, Mike said as he turned onto Robert's drive. Oh, M, G. I come through here at Christmas time, Precious said, looking around the affluent neighborhood. Christmas? Mike asked. Yeah, a lot of these houses? They really go all out with all the lights and stuff, Precious explained. Like Clark Griswold? Mike asked. Who? Precious asked. Griswold? Christmas vacation? Mike asked. She shook her head, then goggled when he pulled up to his house. She was still trying to peer up into the third-story windows craning her head way back when he helped her down from the truck. Five windows up there. You need something in each window, Precious said. Hmm. Mike asked as he closed the truck door. When you do your Christmas lights. Need something in each window, Precious said, holding out her arms, ready for him to pick her up again. He jogged and unlocked, then opened the door of the house. Then he ran back and scooped her up. Ah, carrying me across the threshold, she quipped. Precious, when I carry you across the threshold. I would hope you at least would have on a nice dress, definitely better shoes, Mike smiled. Huh? What's wrong with fiberglass? Precious asked, waggling the heavy cast. All the models are wearing them. Aha, uh -huh. puts the ug in ugly, Mike declared and put her onto the couch. Ooh, love this couch, Precious said. This where I'm staying? No, I'll carry you to the bedroom after I get your stuff in, Mike said. Mike made quick work of lugging her boxes into the house. Then he scooped her off of the couch and carried her to her bedroom. Yep, you're a man, Precious quipped, looking around at the austere furniture. Mike chuckled as he lay her onto the bed. She did not let go of him when he moved to straighten up. Thank you, Michael, she said softly and kissed him on his lips. Welcome, Mike said. Oh, you, uh, you don't need the potty, huh? It's right across the hall here. Mind reader? Or are my eyes starting to turn yellow? Precious said. Mike scooped her up again and carried her to the small, simple bathroom. She smiled as he sat her on the commode, then quickly exited the room and firmly shut the door. Holler when you're done, he yelled through the door. 
Mike located several more pillows throughout his house and lugged an old tube television into the room. He then cooked her a can of soup and used an old, slightly rusted cookie sheet as a tray for her. He then drove to a rent hall and rented some aluminum crutches for Precious. This began five weeks of cohabitation. The first few mornings, Precious lightly complained about being awakened before sunrise for their breakfast. The third morning, Mike found Precious waiting, wide awake, arms outstretched, waiting for him to carry her to the kitchen. You got them crutches, Mike said on the fourth morning as he scooped her up into his arms. But I like when you carry me, she whispered into his ear. When she whispered into his ear, Mike could smell her toothpaste. He realized Precious had awakened, hobbled across the hall to her bathroom, brushed her teeth, then hobbled back to the bedroom and waited for him. He smiled at her, and she returned his smile. Honestly, he said, I like when I carry you too. Joe did complain when Mike had to take off for Precious's doctor visits. He also complained when Mike had to leave to take Precious to physical therapy. Teresa White, a lawyer one of his co-workers recommended to Mike helped Precious sue Mary Bookamer, the owner of Dawson, the Yorkie that had tripped Precious. But it had taken time away from the latest Scanduro project to go to Teresa White's office. Hey, Mike, we all got other stuff to. Can't schedule this shit for after work? Joe complained the next time Mike asked for an early afternoon. All the way out in Lowridge, Mike tried to explain. Make up your mind, huh? More important have a job? Or whatever this shit is. Joe spat. Mike did not answer. He also did not remind Joe of his early afternoon. The next morning, Joe screamed at Mike, in front of the other employees. Mike smiled, nodded, and walked off the job site. Hey, you're home early, Precious said as she looked up from the textbook. Uh-huh, Mike grumbled. Oh, I don't have an appointment, do I? Precious asked, alarmed. Huh? No, no, got run off the job, Mike said. Oh, Michael, what happened? Precious asked, patting the cushion next to her. Mike sat next to her on the couch and told her. He told her of the mild animosity that had been forged when he was dating Joe's daughter, the girl he'd been with the night Precious had been injured. The animosity had not gone away, even though Mike was no longer dating Tony. But it had been compounded by Mike's frequent needs for time off. Oh, Michael. Oh, honey. Why didn't you say something? I would have gotten one of my friends take me, Precious whined. But I wanted take you, Mike admitted. Why? Precious asked, green eyes peering into his brown eyes. I, uh, well, you know, Mike stammered. Michael? I'm not going say it first. I need hear you say it, Precious admitted, taking his large hand into her small hand. Say it, she husked, face millimeters from his. Because I'm in love with you, he admitted. And I'm in love with you. Michael Arthur Morrison, Precious whispered, then kissed Michael on his lips. Now, unemployed, Mike bought up more homes that had fallen victim to the recent collapse of the housing market, did the repairs and renovations needed, and continued to make money. The benefit of being his own boss was he had the time and availability to take Precious to doctor's appointments, physical therapy appointments, and for little outings and excursions. On one such excursions, to the Hog's Head, a barbecue restaurant that Precious loved, Mike found out his true status. Hey, press, a muscular young man said, slight sneer on his face. Hmm? Oh, hi, Barry, Precious said, voice fairly flat. So, this your dad? Barry said, trying to sit next to Precious on the bench. Precious used her hand to prevent Barry from taking the seat. Uh, no, this is my fiancé, Michael Morrison. Michael? This is Barry. I used to date him, Precious said. You're what? Barry laughed, a mocking laugh. My fiancé. See, Barry. Oh, hey, Allison. What up, girl? See, I found out. There's a huge difference between men and little boys. Precious smiled sweetly. Hey, Precious. Barry, the ribs are here, huh? Allison said. Barry glared hotly at Mike. Jostled the table hard with his hip and turned and walked back to another table. You're a, your fiancé? Mike asked as the waitress brought them their brisket platters. Oh, you didn't know? Precious smiled. She squirted some Texas heat barbecue sauce onto her brisket. That was followed with a generous squeeze of Texas sweet sauce. She stirred the two sauces together with her index finger, then held out her dripping finger. Want get married day after Christmas, you hear? She asked as Mike sucked the sauce from her finger. Gives me about a month find the perfect ring, Mike agreed. Precious smiled in triumph. She smiled wider when Mike squirted the two sauces onto his own plate of brisket. Gives me time get this thing off. Can you two step? Precious asked and gives me time get some dancing lessons, Mike said. Brandon Wright of the Fellowship Non-Denominational Church in Sweet Oak, Texas performed the wedding ceremony. 
The handsome man was gregarious, loud, jubilant as he performed the ceremony. His love of God, his love of the Word of God, his love of preaching would never be in question. Mike had learned how to do a Texas two-step and had learned Texas swing as well. The fellowship hall, which was attached to the church, reverberated with the whoops and cheers as the DJ kept the dancers on the floor. The Hog's Head Barbecue provided the meal and the guests became miserable, but smiling widely as they gorged on the meal. Tony Tonicetti did congratulate Michael, congratulate Precious, then locked herself in a stall of the ladies' room and sobbed. Emmanuel Wright, Brandon's 23-year-old son, stood outside of the bathroom. When Tony finally emerged, the handsome young man offered the blonde girl a handkerchief. Sometimes, seeing someone else happy can be a little hard, he quietly offered. Tony said nothing just dabbed at some fresh tears with the soft cloth. When my cousin Amelia got married, wanted punch the guy she was marrying, the young man admitted. Oh yeah. Tony smiled slightly. Yeah, but dad and sanity intervened, Emmanuel smiled. Guys a nose tackle for the Connolly Cougars. Ouch, Tony agreed. No what? I haven't seen you out there on that dance floor yet, Emmanuel said. Legs aren't broken, huh? No, Tony giggled now. Then what you waiting on? Let's go. Emmanuel said and grabbed her hand. Nine months and two days after the Reverend Brandon Wright said they were husband and wife, Mike Morrison found himself at Lowridge's hospital again, for the birth of Bertrand Michael and Russell Michael Morrison. Precious sobbed, screamed, wailed, gasped and cried through the five-hour delivery. In between gasps, grunts and other sounds, she held onto Michael's hand and declared her undying love for him, her knight in shining armor. Seventeen months later, Tony Wright and her husband Emmanuel Wright were two doors down, having their first child at the same time Precious was having their daughter, Audrey, and Morrison. Back in the present the Morrison family was traveling back to Mike's town to make amends with his children. I cannot believe, Mike grumbled as they stepped off the airplane in Benhust, Colorado. New Texas would finally get tired of your ugly face, Lyle Curtis. Mike's former boss announced as he hugged the man. Hey, hey man, how you doing? Mike laughed happily, hugging Lyle. What are you doing here? How you been? Less hair, more gut, about the same. You? Lyle laughed. I'm good, I'm good. Lyle Curtis, want you meet my family? Honey, I'm sure, whatever incriminating evidence he's got on you. Statute of limitations has run out, huh? Lyle joked when he met Precious Morrison. Huh? Precious asked. He thinks I'm blackmailing you, Mike explained. No kidding, Bertrand and Russell? I knew them, Lyle said as he shook the hands of the twins. I'm Audrey. I'm four, Audrey said, holding out her hand for the big man. And ain't scared of nothing neither, Mike stated. Now, know you booked a suite at the Hilton, Lizzie? My daughter's the manager there, Lyle said as the family grabbed their three suitcases from the carousel. But you're staying at my house here? Mr. Curtis, you sure? Precious asked. Mr. Curtis? Mr. Curtis? Lyle asked. Precious, by the way, what's your real name? Kind of feel funny calling another man's wife, Precious, the name's Lyle here? That is my name, Precious said, not offended. Oh, well, suits you, Lyle said. After the family was situated, Mike and Precious in the guest room, Audrey in the old room of Lyle's daughter, and the twins on the pull-out sofa bed in the man cave, Mike took a deep breath. I'll go check on the boys, Precious said. What? They just? Mike asked, pulling his cell phone out of his shirt pocket. Give you some privacy? Precious said softly, then kissed him. Love you, Mike said. That's your daughter, Michael. Above all, she is your daughter. She's a part of you, Precious counseled, then stepped out of the bedroom. Hello? A girl's voice answered, sounding guarded. Mike's guts, which had already been quite twisted, suddenly spasmed. He almost ended the call. Hey, uh, hi, this is your dad, Mike said. Who? Michelle said. Oh, dad? Uh, yeah. Uh, listen. I'm in town. Planning on taking press? Planning on taking my wife and kids to Benny's Burger Bar. They've heard all about there's a thousand ways fix your burger, and so we're going there, about six. Would love see you there, Mike said. Yeah, sure, Michelle said, voice a sneer. Like I got a thousand of these dumb gift cards use. Great, Mike said and ended the call. Precious looked up from the video game Bertrand and Russell were playing when Mike entered the room. She tilted her head to one side at the scowl he wore. Benny's Burger Bar, 6 o'clock, Mike said. And? Precious asked softly. And sounded like a snotty little bitch, just like she was at 13, Mike spat. You know? Whenever I expect, get the red bum. I'm rarely disappointed, Precious said. 
my second graders? Some are just the sweetest kids. And some of them? I swear to God. But when I just get rid of all expectations, it usually goes a lot better. Don't know why I let you talk me into this, Mike said and smiled as Bertrand managed to find the pot of gold. Because I promised you a special night you did, Precious whispered into his ear. Hmm, there is that, Mike agreed. But not here, Precious giggled when Mike reached around her slim waist and began to fondle her buttocks. At six o'clock on the dot, Mike herded Audrey and Russell into the restaurant. Precious and Bertrand were just behind. Bertrand had seen a Porsche 911 and wanted to get a closer look at the gleaming black automobile. Looking around, Mike felt a wave of disappointment, then a wave of anger. There was no sign of Michelle. She here? Precious whispered, taking Mike's hand. Nope, Mike said bluntly. Maybe she's stuck in traffic, Precious suggested. Sweetheart, did you see any traffic out there? Mike asked, voice harsh. Raquel Falls has to ship traffic in if they want traffic jams. So, how we do this? Precious asked, helping Mike guide the three children to the counter. All right. First, you order your burger. You want a quarter pound? A half pound? A twenty pound? Mike said. A twenty pound? Audrey asked. Daddy's full of bullying us. It's a one pound, Precious giggled. Then, you want bacon? Cheese? Bacon and cheese? No bacon, no cheese, Mike continued. How about half bacon, half cheese? Russell asked. Aha, uh -huh, now you're getting the idea. Mike encouraged. Then, when that slab of 100% beef goodness comes out, you walk on over to the bar. And that is where the magic begins. There's over 40 different things you can put on that burger. Boogers? Bertrand asked. Bertrand, Precious said, lips tight in disapproval. No, those? Got to bring your own, Mike said. But there's blue cheese, there's salsa, there's jalapenos, there's onion straws. Sounds like you've been here before, the girl behind the counter smiled. Been a while. Used be my favorite place, Mike admitted. Michelle showed up nearly 20 minutes late. She nodded in acknowledgement that she'd seen Mike, then dawdled over ordering, then fixing her burger. Hi, she snapped, slapping her tray down. You're what? About five months along? Mike smiled, looking at the paunch. Aha, uh -huh, Michelle said and stuffed a mouthful of burger. I'm two months along, Precious said, trying to establish a connection with the surly girl. That's nice, Michelle said. So, Dad, come on. You wanted this meeting. Let's go. Mother says you're getting married this Saturday, Mike said, fighting hard against slapping his impertinent daughter across her sullen face. Yeah. Heard you said, who cares too, Michelle agreed. Anyway, came to see you get married. Wanted you meet your brothers and your sister, Mike said. Aha, uh -huh, fine, Michelle said, taking a big gulp of soda. I'm precious, Precious offered. I'm sure you are, Michelle smirked. That is her name. Mike said, teeth clenched. Precious Morrison. This little cutie here is Audrey. I'm four, Audrey announced. And the big guy there is Bertrand. And the big guy next to him is Russell, Mike said. Guys, this is your big sister Michelle. Hi, Bertrand said. I'm four, Audrey said again. Hi, Russell said. So, just thought you'd come back and I'd be all like, oh, hi. So great see you again. Don't worry about shitting all over me, huh? Michelle snarled. No, thought you'd be all like, hey, sorry I was a selfish self-centered, stuck-up little bitch thought my shit didn't stink, acted like spending a few minutes with my dad who busted his but for me was a real imposition but I've done a little growing up since then, but I guess we're both sorely disappointed, huh? Mike spat. Daddy said shit, Audrey whispered to her mother. I know, I heard him, Precious said. Precious pinched Audrey's nose. And, uh, heard you say it too, just a minute ago, Precious admonished. Nah. Audrey denied. I was just telling on daddy. Well, don't bother, daddy, Michelle spat, shoving her tray, causing her drink to spill. Don't bother coming to my wedding. I don't want you there. No problem, Mike shrugged, grabbing the tray before the soda spilled onto any of his children. We'll drop your present off at your mother's house, Precious offered as Michelle stomped out of the restaurant. Whatever, bitch, Michelle sneered and shoved the door open. She said. Audrey started. And you say it, and you'll get a spanking here? Precious warned. So, what did y'all think of Benny's Burger Bar? Precious asked as the five of them left the restaurant. Next time? I'm going to put a whole lot more pickles on mine, Bertrand enthused. And barbecue sauce. Russell agreed. Mike smiled at their enthusiasm. He and Precious smiled over the roof of Lyle's daughter's minivan as they slid the doors open. 
After dropping Precious and children off at Scooters for ice cream, Mike drove to the address Barbara Trenton, his attorney, had provided. He checked the address again when he pulled up to the dilapidated apartment complex. Yo, 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 can't be parking there. That's my boy's spot. Know what I'm saying? A boy, probably 15 or 16 years old, said. Sign says, Visitors, telling me your boy's name is Visitors? Mike snapped, taking the wrapped package off of the passenger seat. Now, if you was to let me hold five, the boy suggested. Ain't going happen, and pull your pants up, kid, Mike said. Mike kept an eye on Lizzie's minivan as he knocked on Rhonda's door. He winced. It sounded like his fist was about to go through the door. What? Who's there, huh? Rhonda's voice sounded harsh. What you want? It's Mike, Mike called out, still watching the van. Here to drop off Michelle's wedding present. Yeah, heard meeting went great, Rhonda smirked, yanking open the door. Uh, where's Barbie? Who? Mike asked, thrusting the package at Rhonda. Your little Texas wife. Rhonda sneered. Ah, go screw yourself, miserable bitch, Mike spat. Thought you'd trade up, but just can't stand it that I did too, huh? Rhonda grabbed the package. By the way, great trade. Think I'll keep mine though, Mike smiled and turned. Mike paid no attention to the screaming tirade behind him. He marched down the stairs and opened the door of the van. Hey, kept an eye on the wheels for you. About a dollar, huh? The boy wheedled. Kid, pull your pants up. Any idea how ignorant you look? Mike snarled and slammed the door of the van shut. The kid gave Mike the finger. Mike revved the engine and put the van in forward. He laughed when the kid, eyes wide with fright, attempted to run backward and ended up falling flat on his back. Mike put the van into reverse and sent Precious a text message that he was on his way to Scooters. Daddy, got you a double dipped, double chocolate, Precious said when Mike entered Scooters. Got you a big old sloppy kiss, Mike said and kissed Precious, making plenty of noise. Michael quit. Precious giggled as their children laughed. Mike's meeting with Mickey fared slightly better than his meeting with Michelle. Just as he had been when he was 10, the 17-year-old was sullen, uncommunicative. He wouldn't even look up from the table in the small cinder block room when Mike attempted conversation. Oh, and uh, thanks for them cheap Benny's Burger Bar gift cards, Mickey finally sneered. Welcome, Mike said easily. Uh, $10 don't buy shit in Benny's, Mickey said. I know. Quarter pound and fries with the drinks at least 14, Mike smiled. Then why the hell you only sent a $10 gift card? Mickey asked, voice rising in anger. So, you'd have to stick your selfish little hand into your own goddamned pocket. Actually put out a little, Mike smiled. Huh? Mickey asked. Anyway, good luck. Trials next Thursday? Mike said, getting to his feet. Why do you even come here? Mickey demanded. Honestly? Wanted to see if there was any of that kid left? Mike admitted. Saw your sister. There's nothing left there. There's nothing of the little tree in her first grade play. Supposed to be a tree, but kept looking over at me and smiling and waving at me. What? What's a tree got to do with? Mickey screamed. And was hoping there'd be some of that little buddy went fishing with. Remember when you caught that rainbow trout? Damn, that was a fish. Mike said. Six and a half pounds, Mickey said quietly. Yep. And first thing out your mother's mouth? I ain't cleaning that thing. Mike said as the deputy unlocked the door. But boy did she eat the hell out of them fillets, huh? Hey, how'd you get all them fillets out of that fish? Mickey suddenly asked. Ran down to Nidermeyer's, bought three more trout. Mike chuckled and stepped out into the hall. Dad? Dad? Mickey cried out as the heavy door slammed shut. Precious was true to her word. Mike had made an attempt at reconnecting with his kids. He had even spoken with Barbara Trenton about assisting Mickey. The harsh-faced woman pursed her lips and charged Mike $3,000, but did represent Michael Arthur Morrison, Jr. in his trial. Through Barbara Trenton, Mike heard that Mickey had been sentenced to two years. Because the sentence was longer than one year, he would have to serve his time in a Colorado state penitentiary, but Barbara had managed to get Mickey assigned to five tribes, a medium security penitentiary. A few months after that news, Mike heard that he was a grandfather. Michelle Shrinton had given birth to Louise Charlotte Shrinton, a three-pound, two-ounce cutie. Three pounds? Precious asked. Michael, that's not right. And, through Barbara, Mike heard that his granddaughter had not lived to see her one-week anniversary. The tears Mike shed were heartfelt as he pinned a letter of condolence to his daughter and her estranged husband, Alan Charles Shrinton. Seven months later, Precious gave birth to Olivia Nicole Morrison. Mike was overwhelmed with joy, but a strange sense of pain haunted him. He held his daughter, but he could never hold his grandson. Three weeks later, world was to collapse again. 
Precious was waiting on the driveway waiting for Audrey to return from her school. As the school bus came to a halt and Precious walked towards the bus, a man driving his pickup truck at high speed struck Precious and later rammed on a nearby house. Audrey saw the whole ordeal. Three hours later Precious was put on life support at the nearby hospital. Mike was not crying. He was just stunned. He was still trying to process the phone call that shattered his world. He drove to the hospital without any problem, but he felt that he was not driving. He felt that he was sitting somewhere silent and everything was just moving. His body was responding to everything. He was holding Audrey, but he could not feel her touch. He was able to see Audrey crying yet he was unable to understand what to tell her. His silence was broken when the doctor finally came out and spoke the words, Mr. Morrison, I tried my best. She is in a better place now. Mike felt the feeling of silence again, stood there for what felt like an eternity. He only came back to his senses when Audrey shook his hand and asked, Can we see mom? Mike knew that it was time for the most difficult conversation that he ever had. We may not see mommy again. God asked her to come and stay with her in heaven. So, she has gone in a deep sleep and might not wake up for a long, long time. He never knew if Audrey understood. But she said, Okay, let her sleep. We should go home. The little baby needs to feed. It has been a long time for her without mommy. Mike did not know if Audrey was playing a game or did. She just grew up to become the big lady of the house. He would have his answer three days later. Precious was in her casket, dressed in her wedding gown. Mike stood near her and placed his hand on her chest. This was the first time that he placed his hand on her, and he did not feel her heart beating. He could not hold his tears back when the thought came to his mind. He was never able to tell her what she meant to him and how much he loved her. He looked up to the cross and prayed that for one moment give her life, so he can tell her how much he loved her and one last time feel her heart beat. Everyone said their eulogy, and then his princess Audrey walked up to the stand with a piece of paper in her hand. Mike had already teared up. He knew he could not hold his tears and did not want to cry in front of so many people. So he walked to the men's washroom and sat down in a booth. He was still able to hear Audrey's voice over the sound system. My name is Audrey. I am four years old. My daddy must be in the potty. He does not like for people to see him cry. My mom is the most beautiful woman and she is the strongest. My daddy told me that God wants my mom to stay at his house for some time. I am not sure when she will be back, but I know she will enjoy her stay. She is in heaven. If my mom is watching me from heaven, I want her to know that I love her and I will miss her. My mom's name is Precious and she is very precious to me and my daddy. My little sister cannot speak as of now, but I know she misses mommy as well, so God please send her back quickly. Thank you everyone. Please don't cry my mommy is with God. With that small speech, she had put tears in every eye present. Mike quickly ran out and hugged Audrey and let his tears out like a small child. Audrey held him and whispered, I am here for you, daddy. They all went back home once the funeral was over. Two years later, Mickey was out of the penitentiary, but he wasted no time to get back to his old ways. He hired a hooker and got high on coke with her. His body was found in a massive wreckage that he caused on the highway. Both he and the hooker died on the spot. Mike attended his funeral but did not offer any eulogy, nor did he speak to anyone. Rhonda was crying, but Mike never walked up to her to console her. Once the crowd had left, Mike walked up to the grave and placed a white flower on it. Rhonda was standing behind him and all she could muster was, I am sorry Mike, if only I had kept the family together. My desire for more in life took away my husband, my family and now my son. I never knew that my actions will not just kill my marriage but also my family. Mike never said anything, he just walked away. That was the last time he saw Rhonda alive. The next time he saw her was 10 years later at her funeral. At the funeral, Michelle handed him a letter. Mom wanted you to have this. Mike took the letter and kept it in his pocket. He opened the letter at home and found that Rhonda had written just three words, I am sorry. In her last days, the only thing she desired was his forgiveness. Mike folded the letter and kept it in his drawer. That night he walked out to his porch and looked at the night sky. It was lit up by stars. He was lost in his thoughts when his daughter walked in behind him. I saw the letter. Did I not teach you not to read personal letters? Well, I forgot. But all she wanted was for you to forgive her. She is not among us anymore, so your hate is not going to impact her. You have started to talk like your mother. Mike said. I can't help it. Must be in the genes, I guess. I did forgive her. Just don't know if she will ever know it. I forgave her when I married your mom. I just never told her. Now I cannot tell her. 
You don't need to tell her, just tell yourself. Mike slept well that night. He still thought how could a 14-year-old talk like adults. 23 years later, he was sleeping again. But this time he was sleeping forever. Audrey once again walked up to the stand to offer her eulogy. My name is Audrey. The last time I was here, I was four years old. It was my mom's funeral. That day my daddy told me that my mom was with God and one day she will meet me. What he never told me that the wait will be very long and it will be an entire lifetime. Today my daddy beat me to it. He is finally with the one he loved. When mom died, everyone used to talk how he would become an alcoholic and wreck his life, but he loved her more than anyone could imagine. He did not mourn her, he lived her. Just to let everyone know how much he loved her, he never married again, he never dated anyone, for him his kids were his only life. He was both my father and my mother, he was the one who taught me how to tell me the difference between birds and bees, he was the one who went with me, shopping for my prom dress, he was the one who taught me how to cook, how to fish, and above all, how to be a good human. He made sure all his kids were educated, and he made sure that all of us have a good life. There aren't enough words to describe his kindness and his love. In my final words, I hope he finds his precious in heaven and daddy. If you are watching, I have all my brothers and sisters here, and please know that we love you. Mike was laid to rest just beside Precious. That day, all his kids stood together near the graves of two people who loved each other, finally concluding their story of lost love to finally together forever. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.